On Wednesday, Columbia University President Manoush Shafiq, former law school dean and task force on anti-Semitism co-chair David Scheiser, and board of trustees co-chairs Claire Shipman and David Greenwald went to Capitol Hill to testify in front of the House Committee on Education and the Workforce, the same committee whose previous hearings presumably focused on anti-Semitism, played an integral role in forcing the presidents of Harvard University and the University of Pennsylvania to resign. With the committee and supporters of Israel's apartheid rule over Palestinians and the state's continuing genocidal assault on the over 2 million people in Gaza want to frame as an issue of campus anti-Semitism, is actually pro-Palestine speech. And in response to much pro-humanity and pro-Palestine speech coming from their students and faculty, Columbia's administration has chosen to harshly crack down on First Amendment-protected political speech since October by suspending student groups that advocate for Palestine and creating an amorphous task force on anti-Semitism that students and faculty alike fear will only serve to punish criticism of Israel's actions and policies. Columbia's readiness to severely discipline students advocating for Palestinian rights has not been singular. It is one of multiple schools, including California's Pomona College and Tennessee's Vanderbilt University, that have suspended, evicted, and even expelled students protesting against Israel's genocidal war on Gaza in recent weeks. I am very grateful to have two esteemed guests to to discuss the issue of Zionist McCarthyism on American campuses today. Dr. Mohammed Abdu is a North African Egyptian activist scholar of indigenous, black, critical race, and Islamic studies, among other disciplines. He has done extensive fieldwork in the Middle East, North Africa, Asia, and Turtle Island. This year, he is the Arkapita Visiting Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. He is the author of Islam and Anarchism, Relationships and Resonances. His scholarship and writings have appeared in the Journals of Political Theory, Settler Colonial, and Anarchist Development in Cultural Studies, among others. In 2019, he wrote his transnational ethnographic and historical archival PhD dissertation on Islam and queer Muslims, identity and sexuality in the contemporary. It is my pleasure to welcome Muhammad Abdu to Middle East in focus. Shalom alaikum, Esti. Salam alaikum. It's such an honor to be with you and the esteemed Dr. Kelly. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And we are we are very happy to have you. And as suggested, Robin D. G. Kelly is an educator, historian, and author. Growing up in Harlem, Washington area heights of, of, uh, area of New York, he participated in the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program as a child and attended graduate school here at the University of California, Los Angeles, receiving his master's in African American history and his doctorate in American history. His professional career spans several decades and universities across the country, including as the William B. Ransford Professor of Cultural and Historical Studies at Columbia University from 2003 to 2006. Luckily for us curious Angelinos, Robin Kelly was appointed the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History at his alma mater, UCLA, in the fall of 2011, a a position he continues to hold. Robin Kelly has published several books on race relations, as well as African-American culture, music, and history, including Yo Mama's Dysfunctional, Fighting the Culture Wars in Urban America, Africa Speaks, America Answers, and the very popular Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination. Robin has also written over 100 articles featuring, featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times and Rolling Stone, 
and continues to be a very busy international lecture, lecturer today. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly to Middle East in Focus. Thank you, Esti. It's so great to be with you. And to be with the great Muhammad Abdul, my dream was, I had a dream that you testified before those fools on Capitol Hill and you destroyed them <laughs> in the same way Paul Robeson destroyed them in 1956. So, I mean, that's, you know, I'm just honored to be here in this space. So we'll see. The honor is mine. The honor is all mine, Dr. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're obviously all very happy to be here. Robin, I'm going to start with you. What does history teach us about this moment of quickly escalating oppressive actions by university administrators across the country in response to the considerable shift in even mainstream discourse around Israel's now six-month-long genocidal assault on Gaza, particularly in the wake of the fatal targeting of seven World Central Kitchen aid workers two weeks ago, as we watch individuals in positions of power tying themselves in knots, attempting to help maintain the status quo of unfettered U.S. support for Israeli apartheid? And do you think the phrase Zionist McCarthyism accurately describes what we are experiencing on and off U.S. campuses today? Right. Thank you. So um, I think McCarthy, Zionist McCarthyism works um, only insofar as it's shorthand for really an entire century of red scares going back like to the First World War. Um, and it speaks to a very specific moment in the 1950s. And one of the things I, I'm concerned about is that if we use McCarthyism too much, we're going to be locked into this idea that somehow that moment in the 50s was exceptional. When in fact, what we're witnessing today is simply the escalation of, a, of more than a century of this kind of repression on college campuses. You know, um, you could go back, and I won't tell a whole whole history here, but I mean, even if you think about, you know, the times after McCarthyism, the most intense repression took place on college campuses, pretty much, you know, in in the '60s, '70s, and on. The free speech movement actually was launched against a communist speaker ban um, in, in Berkeley. And this is after McCarthyism. Um, all these mass arrests on campuses over anti-war protests. So what we're seeing is very similar. And even on the question of Israel, you, you I mean, you could talk about Wayne State in 1968. You, know, you could talk about um you know, University of Illinois Chicago campus. There's a lot of campuses where people are organizing around uh, Palestinian freedom in the 60s and 70s, for which college presidents consistently you know, push to have people fired, have students expelled. Uh, the editor of South End, uh, John Watson, who was a very radical um, uh, uh, activist, militant, member of the League of Revolutionary, Revolutionary Black Workers, he was running articles about Fatah in the South End, the Wayne State New, uh, paper back in like 1968, 69, and they pushed him out. The president of Wayne State pushed him out. So, you know, and one last thing I should add is that, again, this is an escalation, but even if you look at what has been happening uh, just post 9-11, uh, we're going to talk about this later, but I was at Columbia, you know, when Joseph Mossad was experiencing intense repression from the moment he walked on that campus. I mean, he got there in 1999, and he was subject to attacks from the so-called David Project from his own colleagues. Uh, they made that dishonest film, Columbia Unbecoming. Uh, the New York Post attacked him, and the Columbia Spectator, which has gone a long way. <laughs> Back in those days, they were attacking Joseph Mossad, wow. and I would I would ask anyone. I mean, if you just look at some of the statements that were made back two thousand three, two thousand four, two thousand five, you're going to see something very very similar uh, to what we're seeing now. Um, and one final thing is that um, even the lead up to October seventh, you have to remember that even if we exclude twenty fourteen, just think about what happened in the spring of twenty twenty three when Fatima uh, Musa Mohammed uh, faced death threats for criticizing Israel at her commencement speech uh, at City University of New York uh, Law School. 
um, and she's Yemeni born, um, and she condemned the occupation. She condemned police violence in the United States, and got uh, uh, faced a lot of repression for that. So it was already there. I've never seen a, a college president in the United States take um, uh, an action or take a position that was, I would argue, uh, was um, not beholden to the donors. I should say it that way. Yes, and I fear we're up for another season of oppression from um, college commencement speeches. Uh, Mohammed, on Wednesday, Elise Stefanik, the highest ranking woman in the Republican House caucus, who rose to that position, having spent the last three years supporting Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election, asked Columbia President Shafiq about you during the hearing on Capitol Hill, falsely characterizing your comments, I should add. W- were you watching or listening to that hearing live? What, if anything, surprised you about the hearing? And I have to ask, had you actually been terminated by Columbia before President Shafiq stated that as a fact, adding that you will never teach at Columbia again live on national TV? First of all, <clears throat> again, uh, assalamu alaikum and happy Passover and shalom al Um uh, from Lenin Lape territory uh, and 531 years of ongoing genocide uh, in the settler colony, uh, as well as ongoing afterlife to slavery projects. And that becomes very important to note, uh, given that land acknowledgements are not just about a temper, it's an option. Um, I usually start anything that I do, particularly what involves this kind of settings, uh, with Musa's dua. Uh, in the Quran, Musa's prayers in the Quran. Allahumma shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani afa wa qawli. Allahumma shrahli sadri, O Creator, may you open thy breast wa yassirli amri and make my affairs easy. Wa hlul uqdatan min lisani afa wa qawli and undo the knot of my tongue such that what it is that I have to share with you all becomes accessible, if you will. Um, I was actually at the encampment um, and I was listening. Uh, and this is uh, was just slightly prior to um, uh, the NYPD being called in um, to remove my students who were regarded as trespassers uh, on stolen land um, and uh, surrounded by fellow faculty members as well. Uh, to answer the immediate question, uh, have I been terminated? I have not been terminated. Uh, I actually have two weeks of classes to teach. I'm actually holding my class tomorrow at the encampment. Uh, God willing, I will be giving her the students request a Friday sermon uh, and leading Friday prayers next week, next Friday. Um, there are several issues to highlight here. Um, number one, as you noted, my, my expertise, my training uh, that extends to Jewish studies and Islamic studies, as well as queer feminist and, and black and indigenous studies as well, post-colonial abolitionist. But this goes beyond Colombia for me. Uh, essentially, what Manoush, she had lied uh, because not only am I not terminated by the fact that I was not hired in October, I was hired last May. Um, as a matter of fact, while I was working at Zionist Langrab Cornell, and I name it Zionist, this is not a, a, a you know just a, a hyperbolic statement because of its collaboration with Technion, uh, but also because it's complicit in so far as a million acres of stolen land and the displacement over two hundred and fifty nations at the very least. Um, so. Uh, And this was an attempt to subvert, to engage in character assassination, to blacklist me insofar as any opportunity, uh, be it at Columbia, actually, or elsewhere, because a matter of fact that faculty and students have been advocating from practically the first period in which I actually spent here, insofar as that a position would be created for me for the year that is following, given my interdisciplinary expertise, but also my organizing experience that extends over 20 years, um, you know, with indigenous land defending, with black abolition, um, and so on and so forth. Um, with the Zapatistas in Chiapas and Mexico, my involvement in uh, the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that uh, Shafiq, uh, be it she misled, uh, but ultimately she did not engage in any kind of fact check checking. She subverted my expertise, my story, my scholarship. Um, And because my story casts aspersion at the Ivy League liberal brochure 
of um, Come to Colombia, this multicultural liberal arts institute uh, in which many languages are spoken because I cast aspersion or question the myth of the American dream, but rather see it as an American nightmare, as Malcolm had referred to it. Um, because I call for the fact that land back in Palestine has to be tied to land back over here in terms of indigenous sovereignty and black self-determination, because I work within the context of 1492 globally and what happened with Muslims and Jews in Spain and what happened with indigenous people here being called savages and heathens, savage being the racial descriptor, hearing be, and heathens being the, the, the sort of religious descriptor. I mean, it's very ironic given the fact that, you know, that, that hearing also was very biblical. Right. In terms of sort of, you know, Shafiq being asked um, that, uh, you know, do you then condemn um, that anybody or do you acknowledge the fact that anybody who takes a stance against Israel is, is part of the cursed people? Right. This is why I talk about religion a lot and engage in political theology, because to me, and I don't mean to be facetious or, or just, but this is part of the reality that this is a religious war, not one between Muslims and Jews, but rather one that Muslims and Jews have been conscripted into vis-a-vis -vis the white man that has usurped Christianity, uh, you know, an Eastern tradition underneath Constantine, weaponized it as a means of imperial conquest and war, and projected that imprint onto Islam and the manifestation of Wahhabism, Muslim Brotherhood, but also uh, insofar as Judaism in the formation, uh, on Judaism in the formation of Zionism, right? So the reclamation of our traditions, our spiritual traditions, and liberation theology, and so on and so forth, is part of the work that I do, and why I consider religion to be a fundamental arc. You know, a third or fifth of the transatlantic slaves were Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula and the west coast of Africa. So it shatters that myth of uh, the American dream. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to note is so far as fact checking, you know, I'm, I tend to be very precise in terms of my language and the fact that she replicated, uh, you know, I, as I said in my verbatim quote, and I've been saying this consistently, right, and I can go through all the quotes that the Washington Beacon that originally wrote that Zionist hit piece months ago had noted uh, because they relied on three different statements uh, that, that I had done prior even to my hiring. Uh, number one, that yes, I support Hezbollah, Hamas, and so on and so forth. But I said, I have issues because I'm somebody that believes that and argues for and works through the Quran to argue for a Quran of the oppressed, which means a Quran that is against queerphobia, that is against sexism, and hence is feminist, that is against anti capitalism, that is against anti authoritarianism of all its manifestations of words, all ills that also exist, by the way, on the left. I mean, this is this is part of the disease and the facade. It's not like we don't have queerphobia on the left and Islamophobia on the left and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so that was my precise statement. The fact that she, you know, got did not fact check that when I was saying, oh, well, look what a thousand fighters had done. Well, I was pointing and this was the context of uh, my discussion where I was saying, oh, look what a thousand fighters of Hamas, regardless of what you think of them. I have issues with Hamas, like I said, and Hezbollah and conservative Islam. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. I have issues with the mullahs in Iran, but and we can be sort of uh, and engage and should engage in that kind of critique without feeling feeding into imperialist conquest, at the same, and this is part of my point. But when I basically said that, um, look, there's a difference between mobilization and organization here, and this is something Kwame Turi, the great Pan-Africanist, had pointed to, or uh, mobilization is about the short-term management of crisis. Organization is something else together because it involves understanding structures. Right. And I pointed to the Zapatistas. I pointed to the Black Panthers. But it's not a matter of numbers. You know, look at the Hariri, there are millions of people. Look at, you know, what Robin had called the Black Spring. It's not like we don't have Trayvon Martins, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland's, Brianna Taylor's. It's ongoing litany of anti-Blackness because this is part of the foundation of the settler colony, as well as, you know, ongoing genocide. So it, it exhibited a factless position in so many different ways. Um, uh, on behalf of a powerful president of an elite Ivy League academy that capitulated to the confluence of war profiteering um, by the state. What does it mean? And this is this becomes a, a general question because to me, this is beyond McCarthyism. This is Islamophobia. This is why 1492 becomes very important and anti-Muslim racism that threatens the safety of students. Jewish and non-students, I have Jewish and non-Jewish -stu uh, non students in my class, who are standing against genocide. 
the silencing of dissents, and especially within academic institutions in which we should be able to debate. Is it an American dream or an American nightmare? Is capitalism good or bad? What is Marxism? What is anarchism? And so on and so forth. As Dr. Nadira Korvakian, who's also you know, been exposed now to torture, literally. And this is somebody who works, a Palestinian scholar, imminent scholar who works at torture, right? As she had noted on Democracy Now! fairly recently, right? How is it that academic institutions that have been conscripted to the agendas of settler states, especially a U.S. or a Zionist settler state? What's the point then of an academic institution, which we can't argue and engage in intellectual debates that are based on knowledge, not just what it is that we you know, have of opinion, because you can have an opinion. That doesn't mean it's an informed opinion, ultimately, or an educated opinion. What does it mean in terms of research that requires intellectuals to be attentive to details? Women, men, children in Gaza, whose universities have been destroyed. Uh, this is this is the behavior of, of universities that, that acquiesce to, you know, uh, the religious settler institutions uh, and threaten the safety of, again, students, fellow colleagues. And, and what does it mean in terms of the infantilization of youth? As if youth can't think for themselves, as if they're not watching a genocide unfold, live streamed, right? On, you know, phones that are mined and produced from another genocide in the Congo, um, copper and cobalt, and assembled in the form of semiconductors when we're talking about the ethnic cleansing of the Uyghur. So, so, you know, uh, so it was, it was quite sad to see intellectualism reduced to this extent and degree and, and, and to see, you know, Manoush throwing everything that academia stands for, let alone, you know, uh, people who are experts in these fields of knowledge underneath the bus. You've, um, been, you've yeah. been listening to Middle East in Focus on listener-supported KPFK. I'm Esty Chandler, very fortunate to be joined today by two esteemed guests, Robin D.G. Kelly of UCLA and Mohammed Abdu of Columbia University discussing the rising Zionist McCarthyism on American campuses from coast to coast. KPFK is a listener-supported public radio station, part of the Pacifica Network. That is why you don't hear commercials here. We are now celebrating our 75th anniversary of being on air, a considerable milestone for an independent media network whose idea was born out of the detention camp where conscientious objectors were forcibly detained during World War II. KPFK and Pacifica Network were created by people who were alarmed by the power that large corporations and governments and institutions had in shaping the stories that we are told, which in turn shaped the public narrative. We're a radio station and a radio network that took the bold move not to rely on corporations or our government for funding through advertising and underwriting, and instead, for all of these years, have relied on the community that we serve, both by having people like Negwa and me donate our time and labor to this endeavor and by reaching out to the community we serve to donate whatever they can afford to keep the lights on and this station running. So I'm asking you now to help us keep going, help us continue to raise the voices of people like our guest today, Mohammed Abdu and Robin D.G. Kelly, by calling 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-5735, or by logging on to kpfk.org to make a donation today. We literally have only two minutes. Robin, uh, I wonder if you could talk about um, the false narratives that were framed in the pri prior proce proceedings of Congress in their long, um, well-documented letter that uh, mm -hmm. that was written by 23 Jewish faculty members at Columbia and Barnard, they wrote, quote, we see these proceedings for the disingenuous political theater that they are, and we object to your now being cast as a villain in this po political theater of new McCarthyism. The real purpose of these hearings has been to rehearse and amplify decades long bad faith efforts to undermine universities as sites of learning, critical thinking, and knowledge production. Right. So um, I actually think Muhammad answered that question, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, and laid it out because this is a long, long, long struggle. The, the two things that with the minute I have left, the two things I just want to point out 
Uh, one is that universities have always been contested space. Even when people think it's the classical moments, the moment that most of us have been excluded, you know? So I can't, I don't imagine a moment in which the university was what even my friends think it once was. It's still contested. It will always be contested. And the last thing I just want to say is that people have been celebrating through this, a certain kind of identity politics, the fact that the president of Colombia is Egyptian. Um, but what Egyptian is she? She's also like, I mean, the fact that she worked for the Bank of England, which is the most colonial institution that goes back to the 17th century in the slave trade. The fact that she worked for the IMF, she was taking care of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She comes from a class and a form of power that is not exceptional. I'm not saying that she's exceptional. This is representative of what these corporate institutions have been doing for a long time. So what we need to fight for is something much bigger that is struggling over knowledge that's liberatory, which is always a dangerous thing. Um, and so we can't, but I don't think that we should put too much stock in trying to save the university, uh, but instead trying to transform social life itself and decolonize. And that I think is exactly what Muhammad was, has been getting to at, throughout um, his response. And, and I just hope that people keep listening to that.